So the way we're going to work the review session today is um, I'm going to review for you very quickly the main themes and topics that we've covered in modules one through three. And then Dr. Karen, uh, who's in another location, she's up at Clark University uh, in her office. Dr. Karen is going to do modules four, five, and six. Um, send us additional questions while we're going through the course of the review. Um, and we are, as I said earlier, we have a number of questions already. We'll work through those questions during our time together. Uh, so let me start by just reminding you what the goals for our course were. Um, we were wanting to introduce you to land tenure and property rights as, as an important development issue, one that cuts across many different sectors. Um, we wanted to provide you with a strong background in key land tenure and property rights terms and concepts. And sometimes these concepts are complicated and a little bit opaque. And so we hope that through the early modules, you feel much more comfortable with the terms and concepts we've been presenting. Um, we also wanted to, dis to discuss with you how land tenure and property rights issues relate to and affect other development sectors. And so you've had so far some very interesting modules on economic growth, you've had modules on food security, you've had modules on, um, uh, uh, already forgetting, uh, modules on climate change um, and modules on gender. So, so some really interesting modules that we've gone through already and, and we hope you can see how land tenure relates to those issues. And then we wanted to enable you, whether you're an NGO, whether you're working for a development agency, whether you're working as a researcher, we were hoping that you'd be able to improve the way you approach your own work as a result of having spent some time thinking about and engaging on these particular issues. So that was the general overall goal for the, um, the, the MOOC. Uh, then more specifically, I want to walk through for just a moment some of the main topics, key takeaway points from module number one, which was about the way in which land tenure and property rights are oftentimes evolving in response to um, actions, activities, uh, historical events that are that are taking place around us all the time. Um, so some key takeaways from lesson one is that people of course have always and continue to depend on land and, and the rules that people develop to access, allocate, use, transfer rights over land, um, they have evolved over the course of time and they continue to evolve in many situations depending again upon this local context. These land tenure and property rights rules compromise what institutional economists would call the rules of the game. Um, and they're used to address key, key considerations within a particular society. And those considerations are important because how you decide who has access to a resource, how you go about enforcing rules, when people violate rules about how you access resources, can really make an important of conflict, in terms of levels of empowerment, in terms of voice and participation, and then also perhaps in terms of things like economic growth and environmental conservation. Um, so land tenure and property rights rules interact many different elements of social, economic, and political development. In some, in, in, we think in many situations they actually create when they're secure and enforceable, clear, they create positive incentives to activity. Um, they certainly affect when these rules are, are enforceable. They conflict within a society. So the more who are living in a, in a tenure secure environment. And the mitigation strategies you adopt to deal with those different environments will be different based on whether you're in a secure or less secure environment. 
of the way in which property systems, land tenure systems change and evolve. A question we talked about also in module one is why? Why do systems change and why do they evolve? And we talked about the role that history plays in this process. Um, many times land tenure systems will change for reasons that you'll see over and over again. It may be that land systems change in response to a growing population pressure. Increasing population means that there's increasing demand for land. If there's a fixed quantity of land, then that fixed quantity becomes scarcer, demand rises, the value of land will be rising in response to increasing demand. People may have incentives to try to increase land buildings in a situation like that. Sometimes technology the way in which the invention of barbed wire in the United States um, made it easier for people to enclose properties, properties that had previously been commons properties. And that process, that technology that made it cheaper and easier to enclose properties uh, led to the development of more privatized rights in the United States in the 19th century. Um, so these are changes and sometimes drive changes. Of course, other times changes are driven framework changing or by things like natural disasters occurring that create different different situations on the ground. So remember that these changes happen unevenly across time and space and across cultures and so that's why you'll see different property rights regimes today in different environments. Um, but not attending to or, or neglecting uh, the mosaic that explains why there's weak land tenure and property rights in many developing countries um, can put development practitioners and it can put NGOs and, and even private sector folks who engage in these countries at a bit of risk because you may not understand why the system has evolved the way it has. And historical understanding is actually really quite important. Um, that is experience of, of how land systems evolve. Um, is still weak. land government able to keep up with the conflict in the system. Um, and so land rights in, in a number of different countries become part of the mix that drives civil unrest, uh, civil war, um, other kinds of violent action. Weak land governance can be a trigger, in other words, for conflict and it can promote um, destabilization or, or contribute to destabilization, both pre- and post-conflict. Inefficiencies in land transactions um, that are the result of weak governance systems also waste resources. You know, land is one of those sectors where there actually is um, quite a high level of corruption in many countries. Uh, paying people to get access to land administration services that should be provided by the state uh, without having to pay bribes means that resources are being spent that way rather than being, being spent more efficiently uh, and being put to other kinds of uses. Um, weak land governance also has consequences in terms of housing and property uh, that can be seized when systems don't ensure proper due process um, or when assets are not able to be used as collateral in some in some countries. So in some countries, um, land and housing can be effectively used as collateral to access credit. In other situations, it may be very difficult actually to use land or property um, as as collateral to uh, to to as collateral for lending as collateralized lending. Um, but in cases in countries where it it would be feasible, or in parts of countries, maybe urban areas where it might be more feasible to use land or property as collateral for access to credit. If that's not feasible because of a weak land governance system, then that might be a constraint to economic growth. And then finally, uh, weak land governance has had some consequences in terms of making it easier for people uh, to get access to parcels of land in what might be called a land grabbing, um, in, a, in a kind of land grab. Uh, it's very interesting to know Note, Cynthia, Cynthia and I um, shared with our colleagues this week an article that's in, the, that's in Foreign Policy, a U.S. magazine this week on land grabbing and, and some more recent evidence on the scope and scale of that land grabbing. So 
I encourage you to take a look at foreign policy to see what they've said about that this week. All right, so then my final point would be a couple of takeaways from the economic growth lecture, and then I'll turn things over to Cynthia. The economic growth lecture pointed out to us that there really is a strong basis in economic theory about the important role that land tenure, secure land tenure and property rights play um, in terms of a variety of economic outcomes such as improved productivity, improved or expanded investment, and sustainable land use. So the theoretical basis, why is it that land, why is it that secure positive development outcomes, that theoretical basis is, is pretty supported by uh, a growing body of evidence. The evolution of land tenure and property rights is very closely linked, um, Dr. Childress reminded us, to economic history and to different kinds of philosophies. So these philosophies might be, um, say, capitalist philosophies that create placed a strong emphasis on individual the, the importance of secure individual rights to property, or they may be individual, or they may be ideologies related to, say, socialist uh, political governance that um, places a strong emphasis on state ownership of properties. Um, and we've seen what ha what's happened in uh, transition countries that were formerly socialistic. And some of the challenges those societies have had uh, trying to decentralize control over formerly state-owned resources. For sustainable inclusive economic growth to occur, um, there are many benefits associated with securing land tenure and property rights. And so um, a question that's continued for the past several decades, indeed maybe all the way back to the era of the neoclassical economists and Adam Smith is, okay, if land tenure and property rights, property rights particularly are important, what are the characteristics that those property rights need to promote the good outcomes? And let me just remind you, of Dr. Childress's framing of the answer to this question, which is that for property rights to support economic growth or for land rights and resource rights to promote economic growth, firstly, they should be clearly defined. So we should understand what the right provides to the right holder. Secondly, they should be secure enough and of sufficient duration um, and perhaps transferable at relative cost. So, uh, defined, in the U.S. we might say defeasible, transferable, and defendable, um, enforceable. Sometimes in the U.S. we'll talk about the three Ds of property rights. So important that they be secure, defined, defeasible, and of sufficient duration that they're going to encourage the kind of investments that are valuable. We talked about the fact that if you wanted to um, invest in a, in, far, in a forest plantation, uh, you might not be happy with a leasehold that lasts for only five years. You might really be looking for a secure leasehold for 30 or 50 years. It's important also that records be up to date and transparent um, so that people can take a, take a look at the land tenure environment or the property rights environment and understand, understand who owns what today, what resources are encumbered or not encumbered, because this is extremely helpful when you're trying to leverage these assets as collateral, but it's also important to understand um, when you're trying to engage with communities or when communities are trying to engage with outsiders, it's very important to understand who really does have which claims to which things. That helps also lower conflict. Um, and then finally, uh, in order for your rights to be enforceable, there has to be some kind of dispute resolution mechanism that's accessible and cost effective. That can happen in a number of different ways. It might happen by uh, people making use of traditional or religious authorities who resolve disputes under customary systems. It might happen if formal systems have decentralized courts that people can access at relatively low tribunals which are specialized uh, processes that deal on a regular basis with land disputes and so judges or arbitrators become very familiar with the contours of the legal rules and requirements related to land. So there are a number of different ways in which land disputes can be settled. The important issue 
is that there needs to be a trustworthy and relatively accessible mechanism to resolve those disputes. So with that, that's a very quick walkthrough of modules one through three. I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Karen to walk you through modules four, five, and six. Great, Carol. Thank you. Um, Great, Carol. So thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll start with uh, uh, Professor Jane's uh, lecture on here. And I first and want to talk first about the extent to which he speaks about how improving tenure security or land rights could significantly raise food production and decrease poverty in Africa. And he had that wonderful um, graph where he actually shows productivity levels for, uh, with small scale farmers, medium scale farmers, and then large scale farming, right? So he had, he had really nice empirical evidence to show how productivity sort of benchmarks against those different kinds of um, farming categories. Uh, another important point that he raised in his lecture was really thinking about land policy and how land policy articulates also with employment policy. And to think about land policy not only in terms of land rights, but also about land access both through private transfers of land and then public transfers of land. Um, because that has important implications for the agricultural economy. And that is why so much of his lecture did focus on farm structure. One of the interesting aspects about that um, perception about farm structure is that he's really asking us to challenge our perceptions about who we think farmers in Africa are. So the, per the perception might be that they are predominantly smallholders on small pieces of land, but with all of the attention recently given to large-scale land acquisition and foreign direct investment, there may actually be um, a perception that it's that most agricultural productivity and investment is with large-scale um, farms. So this is a really important um, you know, research finding that he brings to us to say, well, let's look at what you know he calls this missing middle, and let's look at the rise of commercially oriented farms that are you know more than two hectares but perhaps less than 20, right? So looking at those different sizes of acquisitions and the ways in which those farms um, can um, help to achieve food security. Um, the other point that he really brought out was thinking about land governance as part of a larger strategy to think about population growth, migration, and job creation, as these are really going to be um, important challenges facing Africa. Again, he had a, a wonderful bar chart that's showing sort of the demographics um, in, in Africa, specifically showing that you know um, the majority of the population is is youth, right? So in the in the 20 to 30 age um, range, and these young people are going to be entering the job market. So what kinds of jobs will be available to them, um, and the extent to which you know opening up land and providing more um, space for agriculture could actually um, increase job opportunities, and the important and another important part that he brought up with that that has to do with migration and job creation is this idea that he he spoke to us about multiplier effects so if you have strong agricultural productivity and growth you actually have multiplier effects in non-farm sectors right? he talked about welding he talked about other sorts of goods and services right so if um, so if land is allocated and rights are clear and secure, there could be boosts to agricultural productivity that have implications for food security, but also have implications for some of these non-farm sectors. The other important point that he spoke about in terms of this is the ways in which we can think about agricultural policy in terms of dynamics and relationships between rural and urban areas. And he did that really nicely to talk about the extent to which um, when people do not have access to um, land in rural areas, this becomes one of those push factors that leads to migration to um, urban areas and um, subsequently higher population densities in urban areas. So there's also an important way that we can think about land policy, its connections with agricultural policy, and those relationships with, with urbanization. So this migration and population growth argument that he made is a really important one. The last issue that I want to bring up in terms of his lecture is um, how he really set out his argument to talk about land as an economic asset or sort of a land as an instrument for economic growth, but then he spoke about land for its non-tangible and intrinsic values. You know, and he specifically gave that point about people having a home to retire in. Um, so it, it, it's really nice to have someone bring in both those instrumental uses of land, but then really to focus on 
the, the non-tangible and sort of intrinsic um, aspects of, of land ownership and control. Um, module five uh, by Dr. Freudenberger focused on climate change. Um, and in, in his lecture, if we could just move to the next slide, um, his lecture really focused on um, thinking about climate change and as an unfolding, right, and an uncertain process. He mentioned this, um, it's an unknown dynamic and it's an unfolding dynamic. And therefore we really have to think creatively about how we're going to address the issues of climate change. Um, so first of all, he spoke about the extent to which people's usage of land and natural resources, whether we're thinking about trees or water or minerals, affects climate change, either directly or indirectly, with respect to the quality and the sustainability of land use practices that, that people engage in. Um, he also spoke quite a bit about the extent to which changes in water availability or soil fertility, erosion, deforestation, contribute to migration and further overuse of existing resources. And here, this is when he spoke quite a bit about the ways in which land tenure systems need to be flexible. If one of, if climate change is going to create migration and displacement, then people will be moving. And the extent to which both customary and statutory land tenure systems need to be able to be flexible to accommodate people moving, which means we also have to think about social cohesion and welcoming people from the outside and the ways in which land tenure systems can actually create those sort of mechanisms for social cohesion and social co um, cohesion and social inclusion. Again, with increasing pressures on land and resources due to climate change, he spoke about how land values are going to change. And when land values change, there could be increased conflicts amongst users. So when we think about the relationship between climate change and climate change adaptation and mitigation, we also need to think about the extent to which climate change and changes in the natural resource base in terms of quantity and quality could potentially lead to conflicts um, amongst uh, users, but also competing conflicts between how a resource is used, which really makes us think about land use planning aspects um, of the work that we do. Um, finally, he spoke quite a bit about land tenure systems needing to respond and align themselves to incentives across um, sectors in the near and the short term, and the ways in which good land governance can help to do that. Um, you know, one of the, the one of the exciting parts of his lecture is is the way that he talked about actual actions that people can take um, to help mitigate climate change and also improve environmental sustainability. And I think that's one of the main lessons that comes out of his case studies in Haiti in terms of the ways in which tree planting could um, act as a disaster risk reduction measure in terms of thinking about flooding. Right, so you know, I think what you'll see across this entire course is that all of these modules are not independent of one another, they really build on one another. Um, and I hope that as, as time goes on, you'll see these connections between the different modules. Um, the last uh, module that I will speak about is the gender module, which is the, the module that we did this week um, by uh, Professor Doss. Um, she, you know, lays out her argument to actually show with empirical data from India, Ecuador, and several countries in Africa, the extent to, the extent to which women have less access and weaker rights to land. Um, and the importance to think about why this differential access of men and women to land or to livelihood resource, or resources really matters. And she does that in the second part of her lecture why she says why land rights matter for women. And land rights matter for women because there have been many studies that show that by improving women's access and strengthening their rights that positively affects multiple dimensions of economic development and poverty reduction. Specifically the ways in which we think about development outcomes and correlations that have been found that when women have access to land and then they have control over the household budget, they actually do different types of household level spending on food perhaps um, than other people in the household would. Right? 
Um, and then finally, she, th she mentions this issue about thinking about if we are development practitioners, how do we think about integrating gender across the full cycle of our, of our project? That means how do we design our projects? How do we assess the situation before that? How do we think about the incorporation of women in the actual implementation and, and planning? And then how do we monitor and evaluate the results of a land tenure intervention, thinking specifically um, about the role of women and the role of gender, where we think about gender as the relationship between men and women. Um, the last thing that I want to bring up about that is the ways in which she asks us to think about women as not this homogenous category. Right? There are women who are female-headed households. There are women that are in like legalized marriages. There are women who are sort of de facto female-headed households. Right? So thinking about the different kinds of social statuses that women occupy and how those different social statuses influence the ways in which they can access and control land. And we've had a really good discussion about that um, in the discussion thread. The last thing that I would like to do is sort of move to this, uh, to move to an infographic, um, because this infographic here really shows some of those correlations that uh, Dr. Doss was talking about in terms of why um, land tenure and property rights issues matter for women. Um, and you know, there's been a whole host of studies that show that when women have access to land, they, the, their families tend to have different. Um, development outcomes in terms of increased nutrition, um, increased um, access to food. Uh, there's also been studies that show that there is um, uh, less household level violence, um, but also the ways in which um, women's access to property can help families become more resilient um, because of the ways in which men and women perhaps save their money differently. Right? So part of what we need to think about and what Professor Doss is asking us to think about um, in this module is really, you know, how do women access land in the communities where we work? What are the implications of, of what are the implications for women and their families when they actually have access to land? And then what that means for larger development outcomes, not only just at the, for that individual woman, but also for her family and the larger community within which she lives. Um, so if we think about, you know, these four modules around food security and climate change and gender, we can see how, you know, women are important in the food security sphere, the ways in which women, um, you know, may or may not differentially feel the impacts of climate change, and then the ways in which if women have stronger um, rights over land, the, the types of development outcomes that we might be able to to um, expect to see, and as we've also talked in the discussion thread, and as Carol opened this up, all of this is really context specific. So, you know, by having these general principles in front of you, you can actually think about what does it mean to do this kind of work um, in the place where I work and in the context in terms of the sector where I work. So I think I'm going to wrap it up here, and we have about a half an hour for questions. Thanks so much, Cynthia. That was that was great. Um, I'm so glad that Cynthia ended with the gender module because that gives us a chance to remind you uh, that we will be holding and managing uh, a panel discussion next week on women, land, and food. Um, and we have some excellent panelists, including Chris Jopnik, who's the CEO of Landessa, and you just saw Landessa's infographic. Um, the panel will be moderated by Charles North, who is a uh, um, Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID. Uh, Susan Markham, who's the Senior Gender Advisor from USAID, will be on that panel, as well as Hosiana Gavru, who is a researcher and does a lot of in-depth work on women's issues um, throughout East Africa and, and particularly in Ethiopia. So uh, I believe you've received an invitation for that panel discussion. We'd like to strongly encourage you to join us and you'll get some additional insights into that issue during that panel. So what Cynthia and I would like to do now is kind of take turns answering the questions that you've provided to us. Um, there are some great questions here already. While we're answering the initial questions, if you'd like to send us additional questions, please feel free to do that. Um, maybe I'll take the first one and then I'll turn the mic back over to Cynthia. 
Uh, so the first question from Nixon is asking a, a very interesting question about how we find an appropriate balance between land going to most productive users, sort of a traditional economic idea that land should be transferred to the highest value user, um, as compared to the non-monetary value of land that communities may find um, and find and, and associate with their cultural or religious um, assets on that land. So a couple of quick thoughts on that. This is a, this is a really important issue. Um, and one way to think about this might be to think about how we can do better, different, more appropriate environmental and social impact assessments so that those impact assessments that take place before an investment happens, um, so that those impact assessments can take into account the really significant but oftentimes non-monetized value of cultural and other specific um, traditional assets that are on that are on land. But I think it's also incumbent upon development practitioners, it's incumbent upon the private sector um, increasingly uh, to take to, to be aware of the fact that land is, is viewed differently in different parts of the world. And these cultural and traditional assets that exist on land, cultural meaning, um, things like sacred groves, uh, things like um, land being tied to where your ancestors are, were buried, those are important issues and, and even if they're difficult to quantify, uh, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be both A, aware of them and B, try to find ways to work around those areas if you're creating a project, maybe don't include those areas in your project uh, if you're acquiring rights. That means you have to be aware that those areas are there and that means better engagement and consultation with local communities. So maybe at the very highest level improving due diligence around how you engage with local communities can help you understand those specific context, those context specific issues. Um, maybe beginning to think about how one would value things like this if one were able to. You know, we value things like ecosystem services now. Could we value cultural assets as well? Um, but then also thinking about how we can improve environmental and social impact assessments to take into account those needs might be just a couple of quick thoughts on how, how you could uh, address the questions that Nixon has raised. And so, um, Cynthia, maybe I'll turn it over to you to answer a question and I'll pick up after you. Okay, Cynthia, we can't hear you, so maybe you need to turn your mic back on. Yes, yes. that would be a good idea. Sorry, I was on mute. Okay, so I'm going to um, move down a few questions, and uh, since I just ended with gender, I'd like to pick up on this question that sort of um, focuses on creating awareness uh, amongst women, um, especially in contexts where women may be illiterate or um, less educated and therefore not necessarily have um, um, the access to information to sort of understand um, legal and land policies. Um, because as, as, as the person posing the question does, uh, does pose, you know, this does uh, create limitations. Um, so there actually um, a lot, there is actually much more attention being paid now um, to legal aid and awareness programming around women's rights. These can either be done in the education sector or in the natural resource management sector or actually um, in programs that focus on gender empowerment and equality where you know these are basic education programs we, we you do find women who are in these situations and you find ways to provide them access to information um, in a way that's accessible to them about you know what does it say in their own constitutions about women's access to land um, how do how do those and then as we talked about in the module, um, what does the relationship say between um, a woman's land rights and then marital law, right? And finding ways to bring that kind of information to women so that women um, know what their rights are, right? So oftentimes um, women may not try to act upon or enforce their rights because there could be an issue around awareness. So first is to think about the knowledge and awareness issue and then once that has more or less been established, people still then may need help to articulate their rights. Right? Often we find that the formal justice system is very difficult 
for the poor to access and for women to access. So once, so once as the question says, women know their rights, that, that might just be a first step. The next thing that you need to think about is how then can we empower women to act on this knowledge that they have? Um, because as, as you um, as you note that you know sometimes these seem like surmountable pressures, but I will say that this has been an increasing focus both of donor assistance and um, NGO activity as well as academic research. So um, perhaps uh, I can find some resources and share that um, on the discussion thread. Thank you for that question. Great, thank you. I'll go back up to well, and for me it's a backup. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about the past and present roles of development agencies and in relation to different uh, different land tenure environments. And there really has been an evolution in the way development agencies engage on land issues over the past two decades. Um, and for those of you who follow this issue, issue, you'll know that there has been a shift maybe away from a, a very, very strong focus on support to formal land administration systems. Um, and strong support to individualized titling of land, uh, to today much more support and attention to engagement around customary land systems, engagement with customary um, leaders themselves, in an attempt to uh, recognize that the, the systems that are most applicable to people on the ground are oftentimes those customary systems. They are the systems that people um, feel and believe and, and in fact de facto are legitimate and meaningful for them in their lives. So, so what I've seen over the course of the last um, 20 years maybe is this movement away from um, pretty narrow focus on the formal system and making that formal system operate a little bit more efficiently to a much broader, more nuanced uh, engagement around both formal systems and customary systems to today where I think there is a lot of attention to um, how you actually bridge the gap between those two systems. What are the right kinds of mechanisms? Are they technology based? Are they um, other kinds of participatory processes that you can use to ensure that the formal system understands what the customary system is about and doing and the value of those customary systems um, and, and trying to find ways to secure those systems to the extent possible uh, and vice versa, the, for, the customary systems learning from and engaging with the formal systems, maybe especially around the issue of women's land rights, which is, which is a, a real distinguishing feature between those two systems. So there definitely has been a movement and evolution in terms of donor engagement. Um, and then very quickly, Felician raises a question about migration to urban areas. Um, yeah, Dr. Uh, Jane raises this question that in fact it may be the case in countries like Kenya that there is rising population pressure in rural areas and, and maybe Zambia, in certain parts of Zambia, there's rising population pressure in rural areas. But you're right, in many, in many countries it's not the case that the population pressure is rising in rural areas. What's happening is rural people, of course, are moving into urban areas and the pressures are around the expanding urban center. And so lands that previously were maybe managed by customary systems um, are now facing real pressures because people are pushing out the boundaries of cities. And how you transfer or how, how you encourage the, those peri-urban areas in a relatively rational way that doesn't do harm to the people who have lived there in the past but provides opportunities for them to benefit as well. That's a really important challenge. So, so yes, point well taken, Felician. Thank you so much. And, and with that, let me turn the mic back over to Cynthia. Okay, I think I'd like to move down and, and talk of, um, address this question about what are the roles of property data. Um, you know, this is a, a really great question because it's hard to do programming and policy if you don't have good access to information. So I think one of the things that I'd, I'd like us all, uh, invite us all to think about is sort of what do we need data for and what are the sort of multiple different levels that we need data at. Um, so for example, you know, one of the, one of the um, issues that that comes up in terms of thinking about land formalization is really registering people's names in government registers and that would be at the lowest administrative level so there is some sort of record on hand at the, at, at the local administrative level that people can that they can go that people can go to 
to sort of have backup about their, their legal rights. Right? So data needs to exist at the local level, which then can aggregate up to sort of district centers and the national level. But one of the important points that Professor Doss brings up is you also need to know who your property owners are. So one, you want to be able to document you know, what property is owned and where it's owned and perhaps what kind of um, land or property it is. But then you also need a lot of data to understand who your property owners are. Uh, and, and that, and that fit, fits into her, her lecture quite nicely where she says, you know, people might own land, right? You can ask somebody if they own land and they will say that they own land. But then if you look at the, the rights that they have with that ownership, um, some of those rights don't necessarily correspond to the ways in which we think about formal ownership. If we're thinking about ways in which we want to create social change, perhaps change the position of women in society, you know, Professor Doss is saying that we really need to collect this sex disaggregated data so we know what men are doing and what women are doing. And, you know, what access men have and what access women have, right? So think about data in, in all, have a really wide um, understanding of, of what data is and what data is useful for and where your sources of data lie. They can lie with the individual, they can lie at the household level, they can lie at the national level. I just want to segue back to Carol for a minute so she can talk about um, a, a larger land governance um, framework that the World Bank is engaged in because that also deals quite a bit with um, data collection and collation. So this issue of, thank you so, so much, Cynthia, this issue of uh, the importance of collecting comparable data across countries about um, different, land, different aspects of the land environment uh, has, been an important, has been important to the World Bank over the last several years, and, and in, it has led to the World Bank developing a very significant program called the Land Governance Assessment Framework, or the LGAF is the acronym. Um, the LGAF is reviewing land uh, situations, um, land constraints, uh, different kinds of um, ability to access land issues in, in a number of different countries. I think there have been LGAFs in over 30 countries right now, and in some countries, even lower sub-national level land gaps or LGAFs are taking place. So on the issue of data, yep, I think people really recognize that this is a this is an important challenge in the land sector. The World Bank is trying to address this through the LGAF and creating regular reporting requirements around land. Um, but also, of course, the new SDGs will create an opportunity for countries to report out against land-related indicators. And so I suspect over the course of the next year or so, we're going to see countries um, creating appropriate mechanisms so they can report against uh, the indicators related to women and men and legal entities having access to land rights. So um, this is an area that will change a lot over the upcoming years. I'm sure, I'm sure of that. Okay, so maybe I'll continue on then with a question. There's an interesting question from Kenya. Um, and uh, about Kenya and Kenya's very progressive 2010 constitution which devolved uh, governance over land down to local level folks both in counties and, and among traditional uh, authorities but but this this progressive framework is, is facing some challenges in terms of being implemented on the ground uh, and so the question is really you know what have other countries done to get around what looks like a little bit of a roadblock in terms of implementation for example the community land bill in Kenya that's been um, discussed for the last several years at least the last time I checked is still not um, still hasn't been really still hasn't been put forward and adopted by uh, the Kenyan Parliament so We've talked in many of the modules about the fact that land is a, is a very political issue um, and it's political because it, it involves at its heart the control of valuable resources and so you know Kenya is a good example of a country that is trying really hard to improve the way it manages and governs its, its land and natural resource base. Um, but it, it still is difficult maybe sometimes to get past um, groups who have traditionally benefited from the old system to get you to a new system. So what can be done in situations like that? Well, Kenya is a country that actually has a very active um, civil society. So continued civil society attention to this issue is important. 
Um, continuing to engage with donors to raise this issue among donors in Kenya is probably um, a reasonable approach. Uh, continuing to do things like um, uh, um, think about whether or not there's a multi-stakeholder initiative or a multi-stakeholder mechanism or forum that could bring different stakeholders in Kenya together to try to talk about and talk through what, why are we not making more progress on this issue are, are three important ways and, and they're mutually supportive ways that um, you might be able to kind of break out of this what, what looks like a little bit of a roadblock on this issue. So civil society, very important. Um, engaging with donors, very important. And then having good, strong, transparent, multi-stakeholder initiatives is also very important. Thank you so much, Zachary, for that question. And I'm just going to I'm just going to answer um, uh, Wulata's question quickly because it's a short answer to that question. So Wulata is asking, is there any international law that governs basically um, the minimum plot sizes in in urban or rural areas? And the answer to that is no. There is no international law that governs um, that that creates any requirements around minimum sizes. There might be uh, there would be probably domestic zoning and other sorts of municipal uh, land use planning rules and regulations, but there's no international law on that. So thank you, and back to Cynthia. Um, I'm going to move to this question um, uh, that talks about land right registration um, in terms of the extent to which registration can um, address issues of land tenure security. I think one way that we can think about this is think about registration as a necessary, but not necessarily a sufficient condition, right? So registration is incredibly important because you, in many cases, you need some sort of documentation. Now, documentation can take many forms, and we've seen that across the modules. And, and documentation does not necessarily need to be um, at the household level. There are also many innovative ways of doing documentation now right, or registering land rights at the community level, right, so, so you can have your, so, but I would say that registration is a first step, but because as we've seen in the, in the lectures and also as Carol just brought up, because land is a political issue, I say it's a, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition because then you need to make sure that you have strong governance systems and that the rule of law holds. Right, so you need to make sure that if, if your land or community's land is registered, right, that's a first step, but there are other sort of political and perhaps institutional um, factors that might sort of be impinging on, 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 on security of tenure issues. Um, and that sort of gets to pr sometimes these larger trade-offs that are made at, at the national level. So I would say, so, so to answer your question, I would say it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition, and that registration can take many different forms. Okay, great. Thank you, Cynthia. So I'm going to jump down to Michelle Rathier's question on the potential conundrum of arbitrating between informal and formal rights. Um, this is an excellent question. And so, so here's, the, here's the real challenge that many developing uh, countries face. Michelle is right. Countries do want to pursue, they, they want to achieve economic growth, and they want that growth to be sustainable, typically. They do desperately want to achieve food security for their citizens. That's critically important. Um, and they want to be resilient to the, the very significant consequences of climate change. So how can you achieve those sometimes seemingly disparate goals in an environment where you have customary land rights, you have formal land rights, they, they may be sometimes in conflict with each other or they may not necessarily be, um, uh, they may not provide this, the right sorts of incentives and protection. So, so how can you work out the potential conundrums of arbitrating between these rights? Well, some ways that, that people are considering now is A, secure the rights of the communities. So this is typically important in countries where the government may be the ultimate title holder of the land. This is in some ways an effort to decentralize control and decision making over land and resources down to the community level so the communities are better empowered to make decisions around 
who they sh with whom they wish to engage when it comes to say investments in agribusiness or um, with whom they're willing to engage when it comes to investments around uh, say the per say uh, infrastructure development that's needed to promote economic growth that may be needed for food security and that may be needed to improve resilience to climate change um, so so that that opportunity to empower communities to be more directly involved in decision making that will inform policies related to gro economic growth, secure, uh, food security, and resilience um, seems to be an important, an important opportunity and, and something that many donors and many NGOs are working to support. So how would you do that in practice on the ground? Uh, you can do things like support communities to demarcate the boundaries of their community or commons areas. Um, you can help build the capacity of, communi of communities to negotiate with investors on a more level playing field. Uh, you can do things like help people understand what the value of their assets are. And, and a number of people in the early um, discussion threads of the MOOC have raised the fact that valuation is important and, and valuation is actually critically important. Communities need to understand what their assets are, are worth not only today but what a future stream of income related to the use of those assets might generate and then they should be involved in, in benefiting from those future um, streams of income. Okay, so uh, maybe I will leave that question there. Michelle, many thanks. That was an excellent question. I will turn the floor back to Cynthia. Thank you, Carol. Um, I just want to um, pick up on, on, a, on a comment that was made um, to, uh, further discussing um, property data um, and the extent to which, you know, um, data around land registration is also an important um, data set for states and governments to use for the purposes of um, generating tax revenue. Um, and many of us will know that this has been important since the colonial era, so um, that's another great um, reason why uh, it's important to have um, uh, land documentation and land registers um, because if you are, you know, trying to run a city or administrating a district, then you, you need money to make productive investments and oftentimes um, your, your revenue to do that is, is coming from, from um, land-based taxes. So thank you for um, bringing up that comment, Kofi. Uh, the question that I um, would like to move to is uh, this question that Pat uh, Patricia is posing, um, which uh, really sort of uh, gets at um, the gendered access to land and resources, uh, the extent to which women have had access to land and resources, but that access has not necessarily been formalized. Um, and how do we go about processes where formalization takes place uh, that doesn't leave women out. And that really sort of sits at the, the heart of how do we do gender equitable development programming, for example, or how do we do gender equitable natural resource management. Um, so it is an issue of really at that, at the, when you're designing a formalization process, knowing who is in that community knowing what they use, knowing what they need to use, and then finding ways in which to bring those perceptions of men and women and other constituency groups based on other sorts of variables around ethnicity or religion or whatever the important variables are uh, in the places that you work in terms of um, uh, project design and implementation. Um, to try to be inclusive so that people are not left out. I mean, so. Part of that is false, perhaps, on the onus of people who are designing and implementing projects. Uh, the other thing that, that needs to be taken into consideration is the extent to which how do we sort of address issues around resistance to the formalization, formalization of, of, of land or resource rights for women. Uh, quite, quite often, there is local resistance when any other sort of group is going to have their rights formalized. So it's thinking about, one, how do we have an inclusive process for formalization, which again would be based a lot on the, so the social, the cultural, and the political dynamics of where you work. But as you're thinking about how to move forward with so uh, formalization that is inclusive, also really thinking about how you might handle resistances to those formalization processes that you're, that you're trying to put in place. Um, so um, I will pass 
the mic over to Carol. Great, Patricia, thank you for that. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, the questions have been really good. And um, I was going to move down, but I, I can't resist answering the questions that just came in around the spatial dimension, uh, because this is an issue that's that's particularly um, of interest to me. So, you know, it, the question from SAS is that um, in some countries, you may have completed a land registration and maybe have recorded and registered rights for uh, say individualized parcels for smallholders, but there may be parts of the country where um, these rights have not been registered and recorded and particularly not for pastoralists. And so um, this is a nice opportunity to talk about how cultural norms and belief systems really can impact in important ways the ability of communities to secure their land rights. Because what we know is that in many countries, even though pastoralists play an extremely important role in terms of generating uh, economic benefits for the country, that there is a perception that pastoralism, at least transhuman pastoralism, migratory pastoralism, may be old-fashioned. Um, and, and it would be, some governments believe, preferable to modernize pastoralist systems and, and settle people so that they're not moving um, with an idea that it may be easier to provide social services if pastoralists are settled rather than migrating um, back and forth. So, you know, this is an interesting, this is a really interesting cultural question. Do, do, and and it, it, it shows us the importance of belief systems. If you believe that pastoralists are, are should have um, abilities to move back and forth from pastures, water sources, emergency pastures in, in years when there is drought, um, along through migratory corridors, if, if having contributes positively to economies, then you might want to find ways to not only register individualized parcels, but, but register rights to these, more, to these common areas and register rights to these corridors that allow pastoralists to move. Doing things like that can in some countries help reduce levels of conflict, um, but it's a very challenging argument to make in some countries. Uh, certain West African countries now have um, pastoralist codes that recognize rights of pastoralists to move through corridors, um, but pastoralist communities themselves have been very active over the last number of years now pointing out that, that they are making positive contributions in, in many countries, important, sizable contributions to economies, and it might benefit the society uh, as a whole to address and secure the rights that are important for those communities, and again, rights to pastures, water, and, and ability to migrate. So we are almost at our time now. Um, the hour went by very quickly. Uh, and there were still questions we didn't get to. I'm really sorry about that. Liz asked an interesting question about the future of land tenure systems for non-developed countries. I think in many cases the future is actually quite bright for non-developed countries, largely because technologies are rapidly evolving and costs are coming down, and so more and more people are going to be able to record their community uh, rights and their individualized rights more effectively and efficiently. So I actually think there's a lot to be encouraged about. Um, before I turn the floor back over to Cynthia for a final word, I just wanted to give you a sense of what's coming up and remind you that we have some great modules coming up over the next couple of weeks. Module 7 is going to be on land and human rights. A uh, very interesting topic. After that, we have a fabulous module on land and conflict affected environments. Um, following that, we have a nice module on land dispute resolution and peace building. We'll get to urban tenure issues, um, something a couple of you raised in, in the Q&A today. Then we'll be talking, uh, actually Cynthia will be talking about disaster management and risk reduction and land tenure. Um, we'll have a module on land administration, these more formal services we've been talking about all along. Uh, final substantive module will be on monitoring and evaluation, and then we'll have a concluding module. So I would like to thank you for joining us this morning. Cynthia, let me turn the floor over to you for a final word. Thank you, Carol. Um, I just want to thank um, all of you for calling in for this today, but also for your active participation in the discussion thread. Um, I have to say it, it's delightful when I wake up every morning and I go to the thread and I see that, you know, overnight 
people have been, you know, doing the modules while I've been asleep and have really been thinking about them. Um, so I find that really, I find that really exciting. Um, and I also really uh, like the engagement that I'm finding that you all are having between one another. I mean, one of the things that I, I'm hoping will come out of uh, out of this MOOC is that we actually create a really so we create relationships, so we actually get a community of practice going where we can sort of, you know, maintain contacts um, in the future, thinking about how these land tenure and property right issues um, affect our work. So keep, keep it coming. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the discussion thread.